Hello and welcome to Access Chat. This week it's just me and Vicky Ross from Vicky Ross Writes. Uh, Deborah and, and Antonio are skiving today, or otherwise known as on holiday, um, with it being peak silly season. So um, welcome, Vicky. Um, I need to explain I've known Vicky for rather too long. We uh, worked together back in our formative years. So Vicky is a, a copywriter, and I think we're going to be talking about some really interesting topics today based around language. So Vicky, do you want to give us a bit of background as to your history and experience and how you got into copywriting? Uh, yeah, hi uh, Neil, hi everybody. Uh, thanks for having me today. I've been writing copy for about 20 years. Um, my first or second job was with Neil. Um, kind of got into it by accident. I knew I always wanted to be a writer, but I didn't know what a copywriter was at that point. Um, I got a job as a receptionist to start with and I got sacked because I never wanted to be a receptionist and I phoned my best friend to tell her um, I'd been sacked and she was off sick that day so I spoke to her boss who said come in and help my husband out and that's where I met Neil and um, I was the office assistant um, at a small agency in North London and they wrote ads and I asked if I could write one and I did and it was successful and the rest as they say is history. Yeah and um, yeah it was a kind of niche business as well wasn't it so uh, it was uh, particularly focused on sci-fi and uh, so yeah writing writing you know pretending to be interested about <laughs> Boba Fett busts and and so Absolutely. on so yeah really yeah. honed your skills. Um, I think any good copywriter can write about anything as long as they have enough information. Although having said that, um, I often tell teams that if there's an expert in the room on one particular subject that meets a brief, then you should get that writer to work on it because that's the person that's going to write an authentic piece of copy and, and do the message justice. Okay. So, so I, th I think that, that, that often people dismiss copy as 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 you know, or, or don't even notice copy it's it's everywhere um and, and it, yet it's one of the you know one of the ways that brands actually engage with conversations with with their customers so you know how 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 do we get to have a, a natural conversation and particularly thinking about this audience how how do we get to have a natural conversation which is inclusive of people who are different and have disabilities so I've never considered um, an audience other than the wider audience, so, so nobody with um, disabilities basically, because my technique is to always write conversationally um, and to use everyday language. Um, it just so happens that the benefit of that is that it's accessible to everybody when you write in a more simpler way. There are lots of brands that are writing in marketing jargon or a lawyer once told me it's called marketing puffery which basically means it doesn't mean anything and um, some of the things we write uh, like for example earlier I saw Lexus's brand line as experience amazing while those words aren't complex put together um, somebody with dyslexia for example who's trying to put words together in their mind in a different way to somebody else um, those words don't naturally go together so it feels a bit uncomfortable but for anybody reading those words, you just think, what the hell are they saying? Um, it's nonsense. So I think, like you said, the best copy goes unnoticed, but on purpose. Um, it should just do the job sort of naturally and, and sort of effortlessly. Um, I teach copywriting too. Um, and I think lots of people come to my classes thinking they're going to learn some big secret or I'm going to come up with some big reveal because um, I have 20 years of experience to share. Um, and when I come out with, it's not rocket science, just write how you talk, I think people are really disappointed actually that they're not getting something bigger or more value for their money. Um, <laughs> but, but that is the secret. Um, to write how you talk. I mean, that's a difficult thing to do when we're so conditioned at school to write so formally and, and proper. Um, it's a difficult habit to break to sort of use contractions like can't instead of cannot. Yeah, but I, I, I suppose not only have you got the the desire to talk in a conversation, uh, to write in a conversational tone, but you've also got the constraints of of how much space you've got. And I think that's one of the things that I really like about Twitter is that despite it being quite difficult for for me to um 
compose language, Twitter um, distills stuff down. So you have to think about what you're going to say before you write it, or, or one would hope you do. Um, it's not always the case from what I see in my stream, but <laughs> but but it does it does I guess give, make you think about what you're doing. So um, there's definitely an, an art to composing a good tweet, and there must be I, I would think there's an art to writing a good piece of copy as well. There are so many words that you can get rid of, um, and uh, so I, sorry I also teach at an advertising school. So when I was mentioned teaching earlier, that's it. Um, private courses that I run with organizations like DNAD, uh, which is a big advertising industry body that supports creatives from the beginning to the end of their career pretty much. Um, but teaching at school, um, because they're, the students are closer to having left um, traditional education, they are writing formal English uh, like we were taught. Um, so they write quite long sentences with uh, words like that in them. So, um, for example, um, I would think that you would like a cup of coffee. I, I just made that up. Um, but you can take the word that out of nearly every sentence. So I would think you would like a cup of coffee, coffee still works. Um, so that and very, those two words, they can always come out. And there is always a way to shorten a sentence and, and take out words that you don't need or to use contractions like I mentioned to get rid of two words and change them for one. So obviously the key is to, to convey meaning and to be un unambiguous. And I think that that's particularly important for people with specific learning difficulties because actually we really want to um, you know, stuff to be clear. Now, if you're, you're you're engaging with people of an older generation, I think that's also the case. Um, so, you're teaching people across multiple areas. C can anyone be a copywriter? And sort of what what tools um, would you you recommend? Um, you know, and, and sort of have, have you come across people with accessibility issues before who are working in the in the profession? Um, I like the question, can anyone be a copywriter? I recently wrote a blog post for the Marketing Society and the title was Everyone and No One is a Copywriter because everyone can write something um, but yet no one wants to call themselves a copywriter as they're entering into the industry, but that's a different um, topic. Um, can anyone be a copywriter? I think with the with the right experience and training and practice, I mean, anyone can do anything, right? Yeah. Um, but can people with accessibility issues, so I'm really interested in this area, and until you and I started speaking recently, it wasn't even something I'd considered. I've met a lot of um, creative people with dyslexia, um, and it seems to be um, quite common actually. I don't know if that's because the mind works in different ways and solves issues in a different way to maybe a more analytical mind, um, and that allows those people to be more creative. Um, having said that, in the lead up to this chat, I did speak with a number of creative people who, one in particular, interestingly, said that he could never have been a head of copy, even though he had written copy up until a certain point in his career. He didn't think he could get to that top position because of his dyslexia, because he didn't think he was able to think quick enough, um, to write quick enough, or even to review other people's copy and be able to help and guide them in the team below him, which I thought was interesting that you would get to a certain point and then think you'd have to stop. Um, but he yeah. also said that being creative um, uh, uh, with dyslexia meant that he spent more time coming up with solutions to briefs. And I think we're in, in any industry, we're in such a fast paced world, we're expected to deliver instantly. I mean, I often, I think lots of people talk about being creative on demand, which is virtually impossible. You know, you don't often come up with an award winning, um, high sales idea just in a second. So people that spend time sort of thoroughly going through um, an, an, an idea and an execution uh, often come up with the, the better goods. Yeah, I, I, I think that also with it being text and, and, and creativity, you can use assistive technology. So um, I was rubbish with handwriting stuff. I 
you know, be littered with spelling mistakes, etc. You know, nowadays, you know, the, the advent of the computer has been a wonderful thing for me because I've got spell checkers, I can dictate stuff. Um, you know, the, it, it frees up your creativity. Perhaps that colleague that, that you mentioned, if he knows about the technology that's available to him, he may not feel constrained in the same way. He may not have set himself those lower expectations because I bet that he can verbalize perfectly well. Yeah. Uh, and then there are proofreading tools that would enable him to be able to then come back uh, and, and, and help his colleagues because obviously he's got a bright mind and create is a creative thinker. So, I think that actually it could be a really good career for people who have disabilities that um, can work from home, can can do stuff where you know don't necessarily have to be in the office. You, you so long as you can work in a sort of self-paced way of doing things, I think yeah. that there's there's a real potential. Well, also you work in a creative team. Um, yeah. In, in the industry that I'm in, so in advertising, um, there are a number of people involved before an ad actually goes live. And so another person um, told me that whilst he may have had issues with um, his own confidence, he would write copy and then pass it on to the rest of the people in the team to proofread. I think one issue that comes to mind is um, whilst we can um, put... Uh, words into a tool and, and say them out loud you know everyone talks just as everyone can write sometimes seeing words on a page or laid out in an advert can look different to how you might have intended them in your head so you need to be able to recognize that mm -hmm. um, and check that no words are as it's getting technical no words are sort of hanging off a line where they shouldn't be or product names aren't split so for example I write for Sky and if we're talking about Sky Atlantic, then we can't have Sky on one line and Atlantic on a, another line because it's a product name and it's trademarked and the, the words need to stay together. Maybe too much information. Um, but you mentioned something I wanted to touch on further about um, oh, people with disabilities working in the industry. Um, I can't remember what you said. Um, in, oh, in terms of it... it you know, quite often uh, remote work suits you know, oh, yeah. people with disabilities and, and, and because you're using text and it's not like you're doing um, graphic design type work, you could use a whole range of assistive technologies to, yeah. to, to create that text, you know, whether it be, you know, dictating it, using a head pointer or, or all kinds of different devices. You, you, yeah. you can still produce the text and get what from, from what's in here onto the, onto yeah. the page so what i'm interested in on the working from home bit is um are there copywriters with you know a, a disability or dyslexia um probably more specifically who work for themselves on a freelance basis and how do they do they charge for their time or do they charge by project which is an endless issue for any freelancer anyway um and what does the client you know does the client know um, is it an open relationship? Do people feel supported in their career um, with these issues? Uh, I think certainly we're starting to see adverts with people um, of, of a disability starring in them where the advert isn't about the disability, they're just cast alongside yeah. you know, an able-bodied person. But we can't just represent them in the adverts, we have to have them in the creative team as well for a more diverse workforce. Yeah. Um, there's actually a, a, a new an agency I found out about recently called Disability Club. Excuse me, I've, I've made some notes. I don't want to get this wrong because what they how they describe themselves. I, I really think it's important to say. Sorry. No, that's okay. Um, yeah, Disability Club. Diversity isn't showing disabled people in ads. Diversity is hiring them. Yeah, um, absolutely. Mm. It's quite interesting. I was at Channel 4 not that long ago where they were talking about their Paralympics coverage. And I know that, that you and I have discussed um, the, the Superhumans ad. Yeah. Which a lot of people love. Uh, a few people said it was inspiration porn, but, but generally I think does more positive than negative. They also put 
a lot of people behind the camera as well. So uh, in 2012, they, they had a large number of people with uh, disabilities working behind the camera. In 2016 for Rio, there were even higher numbers. So um, I think it, it is important that there's representation on, on both sides of the camera. Yeah. Um, and so if you were at Channel 4, you probably know, um, again, look at it, you know, preparing for this talk today, I did a lot of research because um, this isn't an area I've considered before. I'm, I'm actually ashamed to say, and I'm really keen to um, take it further, so um, that's for future. But I read that Channel 4 offered advertisers £1 million worth of commercial airtime in exchange for an advert that promotes diversity which is part of their wider commitment to improve diversity in advertising every year until at least 2020. Um, I don't know if other channels are doing that. Um, and maybe it being sort of quite quiet on the news front. Um, you know, I'd, I'd rather it was quite a quiet news piece. I don't want channels doing it to get the sort of publicity for doing a good thing. They should be doing a good thing anyway, whether the public know about it or not. Um, but then we see the ads and then we see that um, it is being made public because um, we see the results is what I mean. So yeah. Maltesers, um, you know, that was a huge ad. I don't know if you saw it. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen the Maltesers ad. It's very good. Yeah, it is good. But uh, whilst we're starting to see such thoughtful work, we need to be mindful that we're doing it in the right way. So whilst Maltesers did a great series of ads, they also ran a braille poster in a bus shelter. And how does a partially sighted or blind person know to go and touch the bus shelter? Like, surely that should have been an audio ad. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, no, no, I think that's a that's a good point. You can put accessible materials in inaccessible places. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and that's something that, that we've seen quite a lot of times. We had a, a, a guy on here called Gavin Neat who uh, works with pedestrian crossings for people who are, who are blind. And if you go to a pedestrian crossing, you'll see this little thing underneath the, the box that you press the button on, which is actually rotating, which is actually to tell people whether or not to cross if you're visually impaired. Right. But where they position the 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 buttons and the and the the things to start the crossing is purely thought about in terms of where people would go to view the traffic so if you're blind you don't know where you're necessarily going to find the actual thing to to press the crossing so you're having to search around the whole time so yeah, yeah there's a there's a lot of thought that needs to to go into that and we're certainly not m mature in, in in any way um you started something called um copy cabana and and I was really interested because I think that you know we talk a lot about language here, and and I really wanted to have this conversation because I think that that really we want to engage the wider copywriting community to to really engage and and be inclusive. So can you tell us a little bit about Copy Cabana and and, and some of the stuff that you're doing on on Twitter? Yeah, so um, Copy Cabana is an event for for anybody really with an interest in copywriting. So copywriters obviously, um, but also marketers, advertisers, uh, planners, strategists, anyone that's involved in that you know, creative process. Um, so it's a day in Bournemouth, it's 12 speakers. Um, uh, I did the first one last year and it was really just better than I could have ever expected. I never thought I'd ever put on an event. Um, so we're doing another one this year and it's at the end of September and it's almost sold out already. Um, but I think what you actually mean is my hashtag Copywriters Unite, that, um, which yeah. I started. Um, did you, sorry, did you want to say something? Uh, no, I, I knew Copy Cabana was the event. Um, I, I just think it would be great at, at some future time to maybe have some of those discussions um but yes you, you're right there's two things there's yeah. the, the event and then there's the, the well, copywriters just, unite just quickly stuff. to your point about um mm -hmm. the event so last year we had a speaker from cancer research uk and i don't want to say which speaker was more engaging than another because they all gave such different talks but you could have heard a pin drop with her she talked about writing with care um, the subject could have been anything, but it really made people think about how they write. And she spoke a lot on not using jargon, using easy to understand language. Um, 
which I can share with you um, and your community later because I have it on YouTube. Um, oh, fantastic. Back to the point. Um, so Copywriters Unite is a hashtag I started, I don't know, about five years ago. Um, from a copywriter's point of view, I felt that we weren't sort of connecting as a community um, and that copywriters don't always have the right support in coming up in their career. Um, sometimes in an advertising agency, a copywriter will report to a creative director and not a head of copy. And often a creative director has a copywriting background, um, but they still lack that sort of person in between that will give them dedicated copy support. Um, so that lives on Twitter, this hashtag, where it's grown into um, people talking to each other, using it every day, um, sharing good copy, um, making connections, finding support, uh, from each other. It's turned into a live quarterly meetup, started in London, it's now around the UK, um, so I have various hosts that just welcome people into a pub and we just have a drink and things naturally happen. So people have made friends, made uh, connections, found work, collaborated on projects. And I think that we should use the hashtag to talk to copywriters on the subjects that we're talking about today. Yeah, and, and and I think one of the reasons, aside from you know nostalgia and and getting to chat with an old chum, that I wanted to to bring you on was I wanted I I, I saw some parallels in what you were doing with what we've been doing with Access Chat because that was a fragmented uh, bunch of diff disparate communities that didn't really have a a home on Twitter and, and, and over the last couple of years we've brought more and more people together. Uh, to have conversations. We haven't had the physical meetups yet. Obviously, uh, there are possibly greater challenges for us, but I think that at some point we're just going to have to um, and, and, and do it over some alcohol, preferably. Um, so I, I thought that, that that was one area that um, there were definitely some parallels. And I'm, I'm very interested to engage with the, the copywriting community because a lot of, as you say, a lot of them did felt maybe slightly unloved, maybe slightly the, the career prospects are not um, not fully understood or, or the path is not, not mapped out. Um, and, and that maps quite neatly to often the experience of people with, with disabilities too, you know, being slightly othered. Uh, and so I think that it would be really interesting to engage these two communities and see the overlaps and also see how we can use language in, in, in a positive way. I'm being video bombed by my doggy, um, <laughs> who is uh, who is whining at me. Uh, <laughs> um, I, think, I think you're right. I, I wouldn't like to say that the Copywriters Unite community um, has the same issues as, as your community. Oh, that would be massively yeah. unfair. But um, I do think that there is a way that we could work together. So just going back to the, the lady from Cancer Research who spoke at Copy Cabana last year. By the way, can I just say it's called Copy Cabana because um, another event called Silicon Beach hosts us and every beach mm -hmm. needs a cabana, which is why it's got that funny name. Also, I wanted to be a, a, it to be fun and a celebration. Anyway, um, when the lady from Cancer Research spoke, after she'd finished, we had a number of people come up to us asking if they could um, write copy for cancer research for free because um, I think a lot a lot of us in advertising you know it's, it's sometimes thought of as a bit of a dirty job um, and quite often we would like to do something that has more meaning and more worth but we maybe don't always have the opportunity to um, and just by doing the small amount of research for this call I found a lot of people very interested in what I was um, going to be talking about um, and wanting to find out more about this chat so um, I'd be really interested to see what people sort of take out from this on, on my side of things and how we can get more involved. Um, there are agencies that don't do all the dirty work. Um, there's an agency um, called The Good Agency who obviously do work for good um, and they do great work for good. Um, and I would love to talk about them till the cows come home really. Um, but the, the, the need for doing good actually, I think is reflected by the younger students that I teach at this advertising school that I mentioned, the School of Communication Arts. So every year there is a, a level of interest in 
in doing work for good, not just for the big brand names. And every year that level of interest increases. Um, so much so that the students come in with these amazing fresh minds and they create products um, or come up with ideas that um, if, if these people all go on to be huge successes, which I think they will, uh, we could be living in a fantastic world. I mean, just to give you two examples, one guy, um, sorry, two guys, Owen Hunter Jenkins and Ethan Bennett last year, um, they, uh, they wanted to take used Ford car parts um, and reappropriate them for prosthetic limbs. Um, and this year, another student, Max Lombor, he patented an idea, and I don't know if this exists actually um, already, a, an LED pen for, dyslex for people with dyslexia, who when they write, if they spell a word wrong, it buzzes, and then in the screen comes up the correct spelling of the word so they can go again, so they learn while making mistakes. Does something like that already exist? Uh, there are things that are uh, scanning pens that can, but not, but not something that's doing it while you're writing. Mm -hmm. to, to, to be honest, these days I write infrequently. I've got a pen in my hand now, but it's only me that reads my own scroll. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and that's good because it saves me from embarrassment. Um, <laughs> that, because uh, most of the time it's full of crossings outs and, and misspellings, whereas um, one of the joys of, of living in the digital age is that you don't have that. You can you can use the proofing tools. You can um, you can you know pretty much work on a level playing field with with anyone else. I think that that that, that it's been tremendously liberating um, for for me personally. Um, but I think that that a lot of people do still like to to write, and it seems like a a really neat idea, particularly for school age kids. Yeah. So, so you prefer to write digitally. If you were to come to one of my copywriting workshops, I say that you're not allowed to bring your laptop and you have to write with pen and paper because I think so many people, oh, not everyone, obviously, everyone's different, but so many people write better or are more sort of free with their creativity when they have a pen to just let flow whereas on a computer with a white screen and black text in a you know potentially ugly font it can be quite limiting but what do you think i i think that 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 for the 80 percent of people that aren't on on the neurodiverse spectra then that's probably the case mm -hmm. I, I would say that for me personally the act of writing takes up most of my concentration and therefore um, by using a, a computer and, and I tend to, if I really want to be creative, I will dictate. So I'll use this microphone uh, and, and software and I will, I will say something and that's how I am creative. Um, and, and yeah, I have access to a higher vocabulary than if I was going to write. So I would say, I would challenge your assumption somewhat, and 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 I think that people uh, reach their creativity in somewhat different ways, and yeah. so perhaps um, you want to try different ways. So maybe get people to record stuff into dictaphones or get ideas down in in, in multiple different ways. I mean, I, yes, I could I could write stuff down, and we could brainstorm, or we could you know put stuff up on a whiteboard and, and all of that kind of stuff. And I think you know it's not it's not you know, an, an Im impossible barrier, but yeah. it, but it, it lowers the quality of my personal ideas. But each person is different, so I think the the art of accessibility is a, the art of being flexible. Yeah. Um, well, with anyone, uh, everyone works differently, and yes, what works for one doesn't work for another. Mm. So this has been fascinating, and I know that we're going to have some great discussions tomorrow night. I think we've pretty much reached the end of our, our half hour. I need to thank Barclays Access for helping us keep the lights on and and, sponsor, <laughs> uh, and supporting us. I almost said sponsor there. Wrong word. Um, no. Yeah, right, get the copy right, Neil. Um, <laughs> so thank you very much, Vicky Ross. Um, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, and we'll see you on Twitter tomorrow night. Yes, look forward to it. Thank you.